I ran out of the money. I was almost, you know, I corrupted. I have 200 dirham in my pocket. So I remember the first time I received an email from 50 best, and then I start crying. Just three years after launching, Awfully Bros have just earned their very first Michelin star. We break the rules. We are the first restaurant who promoted from Big Gourmand to the star. It's never happened in Michelin Guide. There is a school, it's fit for you, it's called Fuller School. He told me like for Fuller people like you. Everyone make a joke of me. Sometimes the food is the only thing that you take with you. It's mm. the only memory that True. you have with the recipes. You know what you're doing is wrong. This is the food for aliens. This is not uh, for us. It feels familiar, but at the same time, it feels like something we've never had before. What you're doing right now, disaster and destroying culture. There are chefs who have given back their Michelin stars because of how much pressure mm. there is. Most of the restaurants who have a Michelin star, I think their team, they work for a minimum 12 hours for 14 hours per day, a minimum. And it was difficult. Voila. And people like how we gonna believe on you or not. You dared to be who you wanted to be when in, in the face of so many rejections. Uh, the, the most important things, you have to keep this in your mind. Your maximum is your minimum. Welcome to Power Play with me, Sally Musa. Today's guest is someone who has taken the Middle East culinary world by storm simply by breaking all the rules. After years on television as one of the region's most beloved chefs, Mohamed Orfali opened his first restaurant with his two brothers, quickly garnering global fans and being named the Middle East's best restaurant in the prestigious World's 50 Best Restaurants list. And now, just three years after launching, Orfali Bros have just earned their very first Michelin star. And so as they take their diners on a journey with food that both defies borders and expectations, their groundbreaking menu is a unique and joyful tribute to Dubai, while also still honoring their Syrian roots. Mohammed Orfali, it is so great to have you. Thank you so much. What an introduction. Thank you. <laughs> You know, first of all, mabrook, elf mabrook, and congratulations on the Michelin star. This is news that just happened. Yes. Is this the ultimate success for you? Uh, it's a dream, and uh, I work for it. And uh, I just like, you know, yesterday I told my brother, remember the magazine that we did with Spatafid in 2011? They asked me, what's your dream? It's like, one day I want to open a restaurant in Dubai and I hope to get a Michelin star. It's, it was in, in, in my mind. Yeah. It's that important to have a Michelin star. Um, I think what we did was in three years was Orfali Bros. Um, people love us and we love people. And I think this is more than, than any award that we get. It's it's so easy to say that, but when you get a Michelin star, it's like the, the it's like the Oscars of the of the culinary world, isn't it? It is, and it show you that you know it's more respect for the chef skills. Yeah, and it's for my team more than than me, to be honest. They they feel like you know uh, the guys who work with me since we opened, they feel like you know we did it from. I like that when you say breaking the rules, we break the rules. So we did it with uh, independent restaurants in the street. Um, it's a family business. Um, I don't have big support. I don't have PR company in the beginning. And we did, we did what we did because of our like, you know, focus and obsessions. And we want to do this because we love people. I, I, want, I want memories. I want people like, you know, come into a valley. They like, they want craving my food, come back again. Yeah. Is it star or not star or 50 best? Is important? It is. It put us on a culinary map in, 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 in a very good way, to be honest. Starting from 50 best as well, from, like, from the first year. But breaking the rules, to come back to the rules, we break the rules from the day one. We are a concept about neighborhood concept. We don't have white clothes on the table. We, uh, we are from the modern school. We don't have the rules that or the sequence that you find it in in very Michelin started restaurant. 
we are more younger, more anger, more, uh, um, it's not about, you know, because I want to make this because it looks like nice and then it tastes nothing. So if we focus on the most important for things, how we can add value to that experience. So breaking the rules again, we are the first restaurant who promoted from Big Gourmand to the start. It's never happened in Michelin Guide. Once we received the Big Gourmand, I was, I was very sad in the beginning because I felt like, damn, like, you know, I'm, we're never going to get the star. Because Big Gourmand is very difficult uh, category with Michelin Guide because you are affordable gastronomy. So like technically you do something in the kitchen, but it's still like affordable. So it doesn't match with the star. So the first year, we break that rules, and I think we open the door for other big gourmands for the next year, maybe in Dubai or in the world, to be promoted to be to get the star. There are so many ways that you have broken yeah. rules, and, and we're going to go through those and really dive into it because it's such a, a fantastic story on so many levels. But uh, I, I want you to kind of take me back, Mohammed, because for us as Arabs. Food is at the center of everything for us. Life revolves around food. Identity too. It is. It is. So talk to me about for you, what is some of your earliest memories with food that really shaped who you became today? Um, when I was a young boy or a kid, I don't like food. What? Yeah. I was very skinny and I remember my, you know, my parents like trying to force me to eat. And my favorite meal is was an omelet, bit mealy. That's it. And the one I like, I like it from my grandfather Muhammad from my mom's side. And that's it. I don't like you know. I like for me halabi food, one of the best food ever. But it was very heavy. Uh, I, I didn't understand it as a kid. It's very complicated, very complex. But, like that just completely breaks everything. That again, you know, that I would have imagined. Like, How on earth did you go from there? to becoming I, a chef no. and you, you come from you know w one of the most prominent families as well so i yeah. can't imagine that they you know were very excited when you said i want to become a, a chef no no i did that <laughs> it's not like what we think about right now oh uh ask the kids what do you want to do oh i want to be a chef no it wasn't like this i was nasib and it was an accident to go to culinary school i was stupid in the school i was not <laughs> really good i I don't know. I, the curriculum that we have in that time, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't interested to be honest, to be a doctor or a lawyer or something. Uh, of course, my mom, she wanted me to be one of those. And uh, grade nine wasn't a great time for me as a kid. It was very stressful. Everyone, like, they was forced me to, to read and to learn. And I don't want. So, I used to remember I go to the exam. I swear I never book, I never read any book. I just like, you know, what I remember, what I get in the school, I write down. So uh, my score in that time was 130, which is like one point to lose the year. <laughs> and I remember that those, those days that it was not really cool for me. Um, my father was very angry and upset. My mom, the same things like, you know, what are they going to do with me? So... In Syria, we have, you have no other choice. You have to learn or you have to earn a craft ship. So they would put you somewhere. So my father decided to put me in a very a tough job. One of the industrial workshop where they do SMTP, mechanical, electrical, electric things. And uh, as a little kid and, and little boy, and I really don't know how to, to work. Anyway, so I, I worked there for two months and I love it more than the school. But in that time, I realized, oh, I did a mistake. I did a big mistake where like um, the other friends, they go to school, I go to work. Mm -hmm. It changed my lifestyle. So after two months, my father came to me and then he told me, there is a school. It's fit for you. It's called culinary school. And I look at him. He told me, like, for failure people like you, like, failure kids like you. It's called culinary school. And I tell him, what, the, what does mean that? He told me, you're going to go there and you learn about cooking and you will be a chef. And I look at him. Do you want me to be a cook? He said, like, no, they call him a chef. But don't tell your mom because she's, she don't want you to go there. 
I went to the school and I fell in love with the first time, the first course about cooking. And when the chefs entered the, you know, the classroom and then start like talking about cooking in the kitchen and blah, blah, blah. And I felt like, oh, wow, this is interesting. So everyone said, uh, my passion led me to there. Um, I'm opposite. My curiosity led me there. I was very curious to know what's going on and 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 behind the stage and behind the back of the and no and the we call it back of the house in the kitchen. What's going on there? How they making this and this? How they can make mayo? I was really interested to to know to learn about how the things happen. So I love burger, and I want to learn how to make mayo because. We in back to the old days, very difficult to find mayo because it was something like you know out of our diet system. You know they bring it from outside, and then whenever I tasted the emulsifying, the textures, it's like what is that? It's like magic. It's magic. It was magic, and this is like molecular gastronomy. How was like the the egg yolk take all this quantity of the fat and emulsifying and give you like very creamy texture. So I went there to learn mayo, to be honest, <laughs> and I did that, and I and it's. If mayo is like, oh, mayonnaise is one of the difficult things to do. It's like, as like, you know, if you don't know how to cook, it's very difficult to make it, especially when you're making it with your hand or machine. And uh, I felt like, you know, this is fun. But no one accepted my mom, the entire family. The only uh, person who supported me, my father. He told me, go, doing it. You know, if you like it, taking it. Better than be like, you know, sanayi. And so that was it for you at that point. It, what made you think, okay, th- food is fantastic and exciting and, and a wonderful world that you discovered, but what made you think, okay, I'm actually really going to go and be a chef. What was your, your thought at that point? Where did you want to take it? So this, this is, here we go. So here we, we started. I start like, you know, I want to prove to everyone this is a, a big deal. A chef is not uh, the cook who cook for you uh, to feed you. And then the chef is a responsible. Chef is something different. And everyone make a joke of me. And they're like, you, know, you learn how to drive between the table now. You know how to be a garçon, or what do you call it, yeah. a server, or like or like you know a waiter. The other one, uh, one of my icons, they tell me, did they learn how to make mahshi? Stuff you know, or dolma, and like they make fun of me, and then like I was like, no, I'm learning how to make bechamels. <laughs> so it was fun. It was uh, I don't know. I felt like you know, it's it's in it's in a great things. Chef is not just like that the way they think. It's a very stressful job, by the way. Absolutely, yeah. It's very hard. Like you know, we work long hours. We, you know, the circle, the society. We don't see any each other, and we don't see any other people. We work when people they take off. Mm-hmm. We take off mm-hmm. when people they're like you know working. Yeah, it's an opposite. Yeah. Uh, it's not an easy job at all. It's not fun, by the way. Yeah? If we, I don't know, hospitality in in in, in general is not. That's something that you earn, or like something, sorry, you learn. You you have it or not? It's grueling. 100%. It's grueling. It's intense. 100%. 100%. It's intense. 100%. But the thing is, you come from Halab, Aleppo, yeah. in Syria. It's an ancient city with the most incredible food culture. I mean, many people will say. The best food ever. The best food in the world. Yeah, someone right? asked me. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, as, as a kid who didn't grow up liking that food at all, you actually, you learned that food. And, and this is something that has been an inspiration. Not, you've you've on, brought that On into the us. time I went to the culinary school, I was like into food. But I don't like so many things. I like like certain ingredients. And then I start like, you know, uh, I don't want to say train myself, but I think changing my mind and trying to accept other ingredients. So the ballads yeah. get developed. When you are a kid, different than when you are like, you know, adult. And uh, because they used to force me to eat spinach, I like it's not my favorite things. Zucchini, eggplant, all this like ingredients. Like most of the kids, they don't like it. And I felt like, wow, this is an interesting game. Even the artichoke. Because the way they cook in it as well is not really pleasant to eat yeah. sometimes. Sometimes it looks like mushy, sometimes it's overcooked. But, you know, this is the way we cook at home. Uh, halab... Uh, the capital gastronomy of not Levant, of Middle East, is like the fundamental of so many things. Like, you know, 
techniques and uh, uh, recipes that come in from that landscape. Talking about halab and the culture is going to be another episode. But back again, uh, how the halabi they're going to accept because uh, the the food heritage or the the food culture in Aleppo is very very strong. And very hard for us to accept other things. Or very hard for us to accept changes. You know, that's why I break the rules. And for them, they need to have, you know, kebabs, maza. This is the most important things. The the food that we cook at home, you don't find it in the restaurant, by the way. Mm. You know, the, the one you find it in the restaurants, you find kebabs, maza. And falafel, shawarma, the street food is very strong. But the other chapter of halabi food, you find it at home, only at home. Now they start taking it to, you know, to the restaurant or like, you know, the commercial industry. And that food is you learn it from your mom. You learn it from your grandma. And no recipes, nothing is written. And you have your palate to be developed and learning how to, you know, make the recipes and the nafas. And matching the flavors together without any, you know, you, cooking. You have to explain nafas to people who don't know what that means. It nafas is mean breathing in Arabic, as we yeah. know. And for me, uh, you, it was like you know, a baby asked me like, "What does mean nafas?" Nafas is energy. If I'm happy today, I will. Of course, the food will be happy. If I'm not happy, we like the food will. <laughs> it will be that. You know, people talk about you cook with love, right? Yeah. And it comes through the food. It's love it, but also like imagine yourself, you cook the same things every day for yeah. 360 days or like for three years. So how are we going to do in it? So energy. Yeah. Energy, energy. So I, you feel the energy. So energy and how we handle the ingredients. That is very most important things to understanding. It's like, you know, I used to remember one guy, uh, he makes, you know, when she thought the meat, the meat is always pinkish and nice and, and shiny. The other one make the meat dark and gray. And whenever he touch it in his hand, he give it a very bad energy. So the way you touch the ingredients, how much the ingredients, it need to be cold or hot, room temperature, or like you put it in, and then how much time you give it to the ingredients and how much you put in effort to make the food. This is the energy, this is the nafas. And that's beyond a recipe. It's not something it's a, that you have in a, re- in a recipe. And not a recipe, it's an effort. Yeah. I, can, I, can, I can tell you, like, I have now about 32 chefs. From, from one to each, you know, to other, they have different energy. Some people, like, they want to take time and they want an example. They want to chop the onion, very perfect dice. The other one, he make it like this, tak, 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 tak. You just want to, you know, get it over with. Yeah. It's, it's different. Yeah. Because if you chopped it slowly, you will preserve all the water inside. When you cook it, you know how to. It's so many things. It's, it's, if cooking is a lot of details. Yeah. A lot of details. Starting from the source of the ingredients, it end up like, you know, the plate that you serve it to the guests. You know, it's it's so interesting. You know, you talk about it's hard to, to change, you know, um, and, it, and it made me think about that that point you know why why is it so difficult for us to change particularly when we're talking about arab food you know a lot of times we've been displaced from our homeland we become yeah. immigrants and and sometimes the food is the only thing that you take with you it's mm. the only memory that True. you have True. the recipes it gets carried and i think people get upset when they see it mm. when they see it change because it's like this is this is the one thing it's part of our identity isn't it i am one of them too I don't want to. I don't want to change what I have in my memory. Yeah. Food is memory. Yeah. yeah. You grow up eating this uh, in this way, and then someone comes telling you, "Ah, this is a modern way deconstructed." I don't know. It's like you're not gonna accept it. You will reject it from the. You know, the 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 time you look at it now, this is not the food that we have. This is not the food that we grow up with. So, food is memories, mm-hmm. and then how much memories you have. So, I think now nowadays it's changed because. The globalization that we live with the, with our phone. Uh, the food is not, you know, we eat differently than before. Than, than everyone eating burger now. I think burger now is national dish for everywhere, for everyone. Like everyone eats love burgers. So, like, before, no one eat, we eat kebab, you know. Mm-hmm. So, uh, memories is very important. Um, as Arab, we have the fear uh, of losing uh, uh, the food culture that we have. And it's happened. You don't cook like your mom or your grandmother or your grandmother cook like her grandmother. 
because we change. We're not the same. We don't. The lifestyles change too. I remember before they they used to walk an hour, like you know, from destination to other. So like they burn all the calories. Now like we we force ourselves to go to the gym, yeah. to go to the treadmill a little bit, or to do some exercise. So we have to look at our food in in a modern way as a maintenance on what we have. And this is what I what, what I did a mistake by the way in one of my cooking shows called Modern Cuisine, and I started making deconstructed mograbiyeh, uh, deconstructed fatouche. I don't know, and then I was very happy, and I'm doing something new. Uh, I use liquid nitrogen, dry ice, molecular gastronomy, and people. They hate that show in the beginning. No one understand it. And I was making this for the young chefs who suffer like me to learn about that kind of modern cooking or molecular gastronomy. And uh, I was gifted to them. But my mom and her friends and the other moms, they didn't accept it at all. So for them, I'm destroying the culture. So one day... After that show, I was in a mall, and one lady catch me there, old lady, and then I tell me, like, you know, what you're doing is wrong. This is the food for aliens. This is not uh, for us. They think how I can cook with liquid nitrogen. I don't know what you're doing. And this is like, uh, you know, please back to the old days, back to the first show. And the halabi, the best food was like, you know, the halabi food, what you're doing right now, disaster. And destroying culture. And then I'm, I'm, I'm wondering why you're cooking in this way. And so no one accepted and they were right because imagine like I'm giving you Dolmira a year right now and you tell you and it looks like a sphere there is a piece of puffed rice on the top and telling you this is Dolma and then can I accept it? They say like this is not Dolma and they're, it's, it's true and that's what I'm doing right now whenever I take uh, you know uh, one of the recipes and make it modern or something I change the name like yes. come with me to Aleppo, eat edge, and shishbarak uh, ala gyoza. So like I changed the name because they were like they were not gonna accept it. But even fat, you remember fatush? Of course, yeah. But guess what? Yeah. I never call it fatush. If I told people this is fatush, they were like they would make a joke of us before they're gonna try. They're gonna they they were not gonna accept it. So it's better to change the name and let evoke some memories. If you know how to evoke some memories and build new memories, this is the best thing ever. The thing about coming to Orphilly Bros, yeah. you know, I come quite a bit and I, I always send people, if I can't go with them, I will send them, you know. Of course. And the thing is, every time we go, every time when I see people there, it's kind of like they, they read the menu, they have no idea what's going what's on. Because like you said. It's, we call it a very chefy menu. No, because every, like you said, every, you know, name for, for each of the dishes feels like a riddle. And then when the food actually comes and you have the waiters, they explain it to you and they serve it to you. And then you take the first bite and people are delighted. We often laugh. We often giggle. We have to smile because it's two things. You know, it feels familiar, but at the same time, it feels like something we've never had before. Yeah. I don't know. It's like when I decided to make the restaurant, I felt about people like me who love food. And I want to make the menu is more interest. You know, it's more, uh, chef, we call it chefy menu. The wording, the, the name, the way like put them together is like very, uh, for, you know, for chefs or like people like who travel for food. Yeah. And I want that. I was, I was my dream was like you know, to uh, to uh, bring people from around the world to my restaurant, and we did that. Really, um, my restaurant is almost fully booked for about two months in advance. Yeah, we know. It's hard to get in. Yeah. And we are a destination. I think whenever you are in Dubai, you must come to our valley, and uh, that's what I want. But how did you do that? How did you innovate? and create something completely new. How do you do that, especially in an environment where it's really, it's it's not accepted. People don't want innovation and creativity. How did you do that and make it a success? 
it 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 was difficult in the beginning, by the way. Mm. Even when it was Orfali Bros, was after COVID, people didn't want to spend that much money, and then the menu was weird. You, you read the the name, guess what? I don't know. Come with me to Aleppo. So like they don't know what they're gonna get. Uh, that's why I add the burger. Just to get people in, just to have because, something yeah, that the, people understood. Yeah, we have to understand that also. We we have to adapt what people they like and dislike. You know, at the end, I'm, you know, I want to make a business at the same time. And I want people to be happy, but at the same time, I have to survive. And sustainable, and sustainability is not about, you know, uh, turning the ingredients from fermentation, dehydrated or something. No, it's sustainability. Also, how I can sustain myself and my, and my team. And this is the most important things because I want to protect my team. And that time was after COVID. So we add the burger uh, after the third week of our opening. Because I remember like the first days people would come in and they, they check the menu and they make fun of us. And <laughs> what is that food? They don't want to uh, waste their time and money. And they end up like, you know what? Muhammad will come back. Thank you so much. Oh, we are running late. We're doing something. And I, felt, I felt it like I need something to let the people to sit on the table. They need something comfort or something they know. We had the burger. So we had the burger. Believe me, no one leave us. And everyone loves us. And uh, everyone telling me in that time, okay, after like seven, eight months, we heard about Michelin Guide coming to Dubai and everyone telling me, oh my goodness, you have a burger, you will never get the star. But you are a Michelin star concept. But if you have a burger and, and a pizza, the pizza, you will never get the star. So anyway, I was like, you know, I believe what I believe. We're breaking the rules. Thanks God we get it. Thanks God we, we're making it. And I felt like I want to make a concept for people. I might to take a bite of caviar, but at the same time, I can eat a burger. And it's never happened before. I want to be a, a gastronomy, but I don't want to be uh, three hours dining with very low music. And I feel like, you know, I want to just go home. I want to make it fun. I want to make how is going to make it fun dining. So Orfali brought us about fun dining, the culture that we build. Not fine dining, fun, fun dining. Fun, but 100% fun. But that's actually Once you feel enter, like, like both. Yeah, but we have hip-hop music and <laughs> they tell me like, it doesn't match. As it matches me. Yeah. So Orfali brought us so me as a person. The food that I love to eat, the music that I want to hear, and the vibe that I want, I, I want to, you know, to have in my restaurant, people that want to come and enjoy and have fun. And it's very energetic. It's it's not just energetic. People talk about fusion. This is not fusion. Food. I write it down. Fusion confusion. Come on, guys. Not fusion. So it's, <laughs> it's like because you've got you've got influences from all over the world. Dubai, got, Dubai, Dubai. It's all about Dubai. All about Dubai. It, it reflects Dubai. Two hundred cultures, right? Hundred percent. So to, talk to us about how you created the menu. How do you design it? So I designed it. From recipes that come from my cooking shows, from recipe that has a lot of errors and trials, you know, until like we became, uh, we perfected it, let's say. Um, Dubai inspired me a lot, to be honest. And when I, when I came, you know, for the first time from Halab or from Aleppo to, to Dubai, I never had biryani like the biryani that you have it in Dubai or ciabatta, or or Italian, or French, or Japanese, or, or what other cuisine that you find in the city. So it's developed my palate, you know? So this is the way I cook. It's like food is memories, and very, Orfali bros, that's what I'm saying. The menu is very personal. It's very Muhammad Orfali and his brothers, and the team. Now the team, they are very involved with the menu. The R&D team of Orfali bros, I think, it's like the dream team, really. It's incredible. Hundred percent. They are incredible. You've got your brothers who take care of the, the dessert, yeah. yeah, the dessert, and you do. I mean, you know, like you've you've been to France. Let's let's uh, you know talk about that. But yeah. Dubai is really where you found your footing, isn't it? Hundred percent. So I think inspirations that can come from anywhere, everywhere, anywhere, anytime. Like, you know, you don't need to uh, to wait to go to somewhere to get inspired from there. Uh, back to the memories, back to the links in your memories. Uh, when I went to France, I didn't find the food is me. Was well, something uh, is not me. I, I didn't grow up eating that kind of food, but I studied that kind of food. You know what I mean? So I use it. I use the technique. I use the technique for 
making my food more delicious, more uh, uh, look different. Uh, and, and yes, I use the French uh, technique, but uh, I eat differently. You know what I mean? I like the food is to be more pungent, more seasoned, and more nafas. So back again to the nafas. So nafas means energy, and the second the, the second chapter of nafas is how you can balance the food, how you can season the food. So some moms they have the, the that's why we they call it nafas. She knows how to balance the sweetness and the sour and the saltiness. Her food done is uh, and exactly that may you eat a bite if you like. Wow. You don't need to add anything in it. And this is nafas. Especially when you have great produce. 100%. And I feel like what you do has so much respect for origins. You know, the origins of the produce, the origins of the techniques. Yes. You know, the origins of the flavors, the, the origins of, of culture. But it brings so many different things together. Sometimes that- we provoke what then what's come to the flavors. But we, as we said, we don't like rules, but we respect traditions. Yeah. The, this is very important. So... Yeah, produce is uh, the most important thing. The olive oil, if you change it, change the flavor. The water, change the flavor. Water is very, water is very important, most important ingredients ever. If you keep the olive oil in 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 a dark bottle or in a transparent bottle, change the flavors. Depends the light, how much you get light. Uh, if the water filtered or not filtered, it changed the flavors. The lemon juice, it changed. it's so many things. It's so much details. And that's why you're a master. That's why you know this stuff. And then I'm my hands, uh, you know, my hands in and I test and I keep retesting and we keep retesting. And then we keep trying and we're like, no, it doesn't work. It worked. Even the French fries were like every day I have like, you know, check the fries or the potatoes or where it come from. Is it old or, or, or it's in you? It's, it's salty or waxy or... or the duck fat. We use a lot of beef. Now we don't have it in the menu, but we use a lot. We, we, don't, we cook it in uh, peanut uh, oil, not in oh, it's it's with fat. Yeah. Yeah. So we, I'm we, still dreaming yeah. about the fries. Yeah. So for me, it's the most important how we can come to the Orf Valley, taking about 11, 12 course, and taking dessert without feeling it's too much. You know what I mean? I, like, I, want, you, like, I want you to eat and say, like, I'm, wish if I ordered two of this. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I suppose to or next time I will order three of this or four of always, this. Always, always. Yeah. You never feel like it, you're, yeah. you know, you're, you're 100%. like it's too much, but yeah. it, you feel energized by the experience. It's an experience, you know, and, and I think that's really important to talk about the, the fact that it's, you're not just going there to have a meal. You're not going, you know, for, for one thing. It's like we're eating in your kitchen. We feel like we're part of it. We're part of the family. That are that are coming through and and having a bite of whatever you've cooked that day and you know you have your brothers who are upstairs as well so we're smelling it we're feeling it it's the vibe it's, the vibe the vibe the vibe is something the else. ambiance the vibe and then everything so and the storytelling and because sometimes very uh, uh, very my food sometimes take you to confusion side so yes. I have to tell you the story to like bring you as much we can closer to my perspective why making the food in this way yeah yeah. yeah. Tell us about one of your favorite dishes and, and the story behind it. I think the Ulala, the new bite we added recently, it has, a, the name is fun, Ulala. Yeah. And we serve it to the people who like, let me know is it Ulala or not. So the combination between uh, wafers made from brown butter and with miso hazelnut and uh, the foie gras mousse and the uh, quince vinegar, the hazelnut. Once you put it in your mouth, you feel like you start with something and it goes with something else and then it's end up with something uh, really great. So you, you start with something fatty, buttery, sweet and sour and then you get like salty from foie gras and creamy and then you get the hazelnut at the you know, aftertaste. It tastes like Ferrero. Yeah. So some people, they call it, I, I like that some, some, some of the guests, they give me like, you know, you should call this one Ferrero. You should call this one Mamma Mia. You should like, you know, and I love that. And the, because it's it's evoked their memories and we build memories. Yeah. And that's the most important thing. So if it, you build memories, it, it, you, you can't, you know, you guarantee this guest will come back soon. It's like a it's like a Sometimes journey in every bite. Yeah. It's it's like a journey in every bite, literally, you know. It's it's amazing. But you know, the restaurant industry. 
It is known for being ruthless. It mm. is intense. It is a yes. lot of hard work. And, you know, we're talking about your Michelin star, but there are chefs who have given back their Michelin stars because of how much pressure mm. there is on not only attaining it, but keeping it as well. And because some of them have to give it back. Um, so, you know, talk to us about that. Is is that is that normal? Is that your assessment of, of the restaurant industry? And how does that fit with awfully bros and what you do there? Return it back? I don't know. It's only be like, a, if I want to make it, you know, nice media about it. Yeah, I would, oh, I return my star. I don't want it, but I don't think so. Uh, most of the chef, they, they, they are obsessed about the star. Uh, you're getting the star, that means uh, you get recognition between the chefs about the hard work or how much you, you know, what you get. You have something special. It's not because you know, the environment or like, you, you have, as a chef, that means you are offering something different or something special. Um, I don't think so I'm going to return it now, but you don't know in the future. I don't know what's going to happen. Would you consider that? Maybe. Maybe if like if I'm 60 or what. <laughs> I don't want to handle any pressure. I'm going to return it back. But I don't know. Uh, I don't want to talk about the future. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 it's an intense kind of industry though. Well, you know, you, I you tell you something. chefs, you know, particularly with, with mental health and things like that. It can be difficult. I can tell you something. Before the star and after the star or before 50 best or after 50 best is the same for us. Because you know who is my, uh, my guest? <laughs> Mainly our chefs, restaurateur, F&B people, like, like foodie, like people like very curious about food. And uh, it's very judgmental, by the way. Because like, you find the guys catching the classes, they take them like this, they check in the categories, they check in all the, they, they, they check all the details. The table is smooth, is it clean, the, the, it's wobbling, it's not wobbling, like the scratches, not like, so much things. So once you have, uh, when is my guest like this? So why you have to be, you know, scared? We don't scare them. Anymore. Yeah. With no, with no pressure. But I mean, in, in one of the ways that. So they're all Michelin inspectors. They're, they're, they're all Michelin. <laughs> they, all, they look like all Michelin inspectors. All of your clientele are Michelin 100%, inspectors. Yeah. We don't know who's Michelin inspector. They ask me like, do you know? We don't know. So we have every day at least 10 table Michelin inspectors. Well, what's the, the real value of the accolades of these kind of awards? It's based off the hard work. Yeah, I didn't take day off for a year and a half when I opened Orfali. I worked for 12, 14 hours. I'm there from morning until evening. So, of course, it's paid all this hard work for me and for the team and for my brothers. It's important, of course. We like, we, it uh, also put us in, in different, uh, different maps. To be honest, I felt maybe most of the people in Dubai who dine in my restaurant, I'm still like, you know, I think 50% of people in Dubai didn't know about us yet. So all this award and accolade, like, it's, it's, it's helped. It's helped to, like, you know, to put you, you know, you know, on the map. Yeah. Yeah. Even more, even more than you were before, because you, you do have. Yeah. And global fans uh, everywhere who, when they come to the city, they have to come to all the yeah. But one of the ways that you do also break the rules is is with your chefs. I, I believe they work eight hours a day. That's yes. you know normally it's a much longer day yep. when you're talking about chefs. Most of the why do you do that? No, but because I I I, ha I want them to have the life, mm -hmm. really. Because uh, most of the restaurants who have a Michelin star or uh, they are in 50 best. I think their team, they work for a minimum 12 hours for 14 hours per day. A minimum. That's just too much. They have no life. They're not going to enjoy it. How much I can... Um, look about the productivity of the, the team member. They can give more than, than eight hours. So I think wait eight hours is the perfect. Perfect, like, you know, hours he can... He can enjoy it. He can come with energy and come... That's why I have 57 people now. 57. And that's small square meters, 100 square meters. It's such a small space. I can't yes. imagine. We, we, serve 30, people. Yeah, we, we serve 30 people, but we have uh, 57 employees, including us. Amazing. Yeah. But they're not employees. Huh? They're our brothers and sisters. You just, you, you, because I feel, they are we family. feel that energy. Yeah. 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 We're not only chefs. We're family. 
It's so important. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So eight hours is, is I think, is more than enough, and uh, and I want them to be to feel happy. That's that's the most important thing because we care about the team. How do you stay creative? Like, what what is your thing that keeps you creative all the time and inventing and being? fresh and cutting edge uh, sometimes we're not creative we like we take things we build them we rebuild on something you know we didn't reinvent the wheel uh, i think creativity is need so many so many things need time need money need environment accept what you're doing i think dubai uh, it's a great city for that you came to dubai for a, a very interesting reason yeah. you came here to learn english 100 <laughs> what inspired that tell us the story behind that there is a funny story about a software i don't know who who making it it's called wafi translator before google translator so a syrian or i don't know like where this come from so we just like we i think i'd get it within one dollar remember on that day it's from Celia rasuri yeah 50 pound syrian pound and I, I install it in my laptop and that was my communication tools whenever i get an i, I only communicate by email by the way in those days because they, i don't i can't speak so I write down Arabic, translate it in English, or vice versa. And imagine how much broken English I used to like. You know, I make they they make fun of my emails before. You know. So hang on, did did you only communicate by email? Yes. So if I was trying to have a conversation with you, you'd be like, send me an email. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Send me an email so I can understand. Yeah, what, yeah I remember one operation manager, his name James, he called me one time and he's like, Muhammad, I don't know. He, he asked me for, for tasks and they told him, Oh, James, send me an email. He's like, Why? <laughs> he's like, Just send me an email. So, second day, it's like, I can't speak English. I don't understand. He's, he's Scottish. His English is very, oh, yeah, it's like very, very hard. Understand yeah. on the like, I can't understand what you're saying. Yeah. So, his email is at least I can translate it by wifey. <laughs> Translator. I love that. I love yeah. that. So, uh, that must have been the only thing that you knew how to say. They Send me an email. To, all my friends, all the Arab friends, they used to make fun of me when I speak English. <laughs> fun. Like, you know, because I, I, you know, so many. What have been some of the hardest moments for you in, in this journey? I think if you put something in your mind, you will nail it. Mm-hmm. Were there it, times? It's, it's when... taken time. It's taken time. For me, like I feel like uh, what I ever like, you know, I put in my mind, I want to do this and this and this and this and this. It's happened, alhamdulillah. But it took a little bit of time. But were there, were there ever times where you wanted to give up? I think the, the yeah, the, the time where uh, I decided to open the restaurant was like, you know, wasn't really cool. It took from me two years to open the restaurant or Khalib Ross from 2019 until 21. I think this is like uh, one of the difficult time in my life. It was very stressful. I went to hospital three, four times. Um, I used to work with Fatafit. Uh, I was very happy, very comfort zone. And then I decided to, uh, you know, to take myself from the comfort to uncomfort. And it was difficult. Well, uh, two, two years was like, you know, the beginning of the restaurant was also very tough. I was very uh, scared. Like, I'm wondering, it's going to work or not. It's gonna, people can understand it or not. We can do something or not. We, I believe in myself. I believe in the team. But you don't know what people, how we going to see it. Or how we going to, alhamdulillah, I think we did what we did. We're very happy. So proud. And uh, I don't want to back to those days. What what kept you going in that time when it was the hardest? To be or not to be. Done. I spent all my money in the Rafael Bros. All my money. What? Uh, <laughs> uh, it was a very difficult time for me. And people like how we gonna believe on you or not? To the partnership, it was difficult. Also a difficult part for us. I ran out of the money. I was almost, you know, bankrupted. Let's say I have two hundred dirham in my pocket. And thanks for all, for for my my business partner Mohammed Dahlal, who believe on us and he support me. And then he believe like you know we can do something. The suppliers and the friends who stay with me at the beginning. Because you, you, they knew that you were at the beginning of something. Yeah, but I think I, I, I want to say that I want to say that on like no one. You know, when we opened Orfeo Bros, we don't have money. 
So uh, I ran out of the money, ran out of the cash. And that time was COVID. Supplier, they don't deliver until the cash on delivery. And I don't have... To, I don't have the money to train the team. So we open one slot. We open dinner for training and to generating some cash. Yeah. I remember I don't have money to print a menu, by the way. The first week was uh, A4 paper. We print it out. And this is the menu. We wrapped it in a nice ribbon. And that's it. Half of the team with the uniform, half the team without uniform. I mean that was the hot that was a hard time it for was, so many of course. people. But for you, especially opening a restaurant at that time, wearing the mask for fourteen hours per day, the during the time everyone's scared, they want to they trust you, like the restaurants clean, sanitized or not sanitized. It wasn't really cool. Yeah, yeah, so difficult, so yes. incredible. It's incredible to hear you talk about that yeah. because of where you are now as well. And, and so when you're in the middle of all of that, did you imagine you'd be here with the Michelin star best restaurant in the Middle East? When they said or uh, 50 best coming to do to, to Middle East, I didn't count myself in. Because? I don't know. I, don't, I felt like my restaurant is not matching that uh, what they want. Or it's going to be about the restaurants and the hotel, the luxury one, the big one. I, I didn't count myself in the competition that time, I swear, from, from inside. So I remember the first time I received an email from 50 Best. I read it maybe 10 times. And I sit inside on in the stairs and then I start crying. And one of the team members looked at me, oh, chef. Are you okay? Something wrong? They felt like I lost someone or I like I look at him. We nominated to be from you know the fifty best. And like they were seriously? It's like yeah we, we, I called my brother Wasim Amar. Listen, uh, I received an email from fifty best. We are nominated to be for the first for the first year we're like in the fifty we are in the fifty best. And they're like, Okay. So we sit and then and then I don't know what to do. I have no PR, I swear. No PR. Uh, I don't have marketing team. I have nothing. So I like, think about, oh, we need to hire a PR or we don't need. Anyway, uh, the long story short, the first ceremony was in Abu Dhabi. Uh, on the way uh, from Dubai to Abu Dhabi with my brother in the car, I asked them what number we're going to get. My brother say like 49, the other one say 35. <laughs> and then I look at them, if we get from the top 20, that will be great. So we went there. Once we entered the hotel, going to the ceremony, the 50 best uh, you know, team, and they look at us, oh, our fatty bros here. Oh, wow. I, think, you know, I felt like, I look at my brother, mm -hmm. it's something. Anyway, we, we sit there and we get number six. From the top 10. Number six. Number six. Number this is the very first year. The first year. And then it was the, the number three on, on UAE. Number three it, in Dubai. It's only been around for three years. People have to know. This hasn't been around. That's this all has it been is. around as long as your yeah. restaurant has. Three 100%. years. They're like, we uh, almost like uh, nine months of our opening. And we get number six. And everyone look at us. Oh, number six. Oh, this is something. And it was the third on UAE, by the way. And... From that time, I start feeling like everything get start changing. Like a lot of changes has happened. Uh, the demography of uh, the guests who's coming to us also are different. And then we get Bib Gourmand with Michelin after that. The second year, 2023, we are also nominated to be from the top 50. We went there and then I told my brother, if we get number seven or number five, great achievement. If we stay in the top 10, great. I would be very happy. We went there and boom, we get number one. I was shocked. Really. Why? But because I was not prepared to be number one. I don't know what I have to say in the stage. <laughs> so I was sh shouting. Cause like, you know. And with the second on the stage, I start, you know, like you're, I see like all what's happened in my memories, you know all the, the throwback of what happened from the beginning of the uh, opening 
or Fali Bros, how people they tell me uh, it's not a great idea to call the restaurant or Fali is not gonna work. You are a TV chef. No one believe in me. And it was like trrr, all of this in my memories within like two three minutes. And it was a great moment and a great achievement. It put us perfectly on the map. 2024, we get number one again. So we feel very privileged, like, you know, how people, they love us. And we we belong to people. This is the most important thing. That concept, or Fadi Bros, belong to the community. And that's why we represent the community. That's why the diversity of my menu that represent the people who live in Dubai. What would you say is the secret to this success? We, we, we're not looking to be a famous. We're not looking to, like, you know, we, we want to... We, offer, we want to offer something different. We want to offer for, for the city something different. It's interesting. You know, you, you've mentioned a, a lot talking about your TV career as well, which yeah. is pivotal to, to where you are now. You know, you got into that, but it's interesting because when they offered you um, that presenter role, you actually said, no, I'm not ready. And it took you three, four years? Five years. Five years. Yeah. And TV changed me, by the way. Uh Almost 10 years, about 15 cooking shows. Every show is about 30 episodes. And every episode about three recipes. So imagine how much I did. Magazines and content. The content for the for Fatafit. I was responsible. I was the head of culinary of content. How did that change you as a chef? How, it, did, how did that make you? I was very happy at that time because I developed myself within was in 10 years almost, like 10 years of reading, uh, experimenting, uh, trying. And uh, no one, had, I mean, from the chefs, you don't have the luxury to do this. You know, I was I was lucky also to be on TV, to be honest, for 10 years working on, on the studios, trying it. It changed my mind, changed my mind of looking at the food and, and my eyes. You know, they have like, you know, you have the eye. That's why we say it in media. Yes. They have, they have the, I look at the food, I look at, the frames of like it's different. It's, it's helped it's, me. It's much more about communication and expression. Hundred percent. You know, you because you are you. This is the, this is a, this is one side. The other side, how I develop myself and in, in in cooking. Yeah. Because there, were, I have a lab. I have all the equipment. I have everything, and then I have a budget, and I start, you know, reading, experimenting, and and trying. And this is how it shaped me. Ten years of you know cooking on TV it shaped me differently. Had, me, you have that freedom. The, 100%. And that's the link where like the chefs who's not accept me to work with them, all the Michelin star uh, concept that were uh, tried to apply to get uh, even training or stage. No one accept me because I don't have the background. So I said my, with myself one day, I remember that in 2012, what I need to be like them. What is missing? And I start search about chefs reading about them and inspire from them what they did differently and you know to be the way they are so i feel like there is so many gaps and i start working on those gaps and that shaped me differently without working with that's why i say like you know thanks for so many chefs in the world who write their their story in the book, they write their recipes and everything. They get, I, you know, I work with Rene Rezepi was out. Work, Noma was out working with Noma. Just from reading his book? 100%. And I work with like, Histan Blumenthal, I was, or, was out working with Histan, or El Bouli, or the other chefs. So I get inspired. Like the way I work with them, but physically I wasn't, you know. Just taking it all like a sponge from all of 100%. their books. 100%. And I know that you have an amazing library at Awfully Bros as well. We have, we have, Wait. we have. We have the, we have about uh, one thousand book in the, between the the store and and then Orfeli and then this uh, all available for the team. Uh, you give your team homework, yes. I think. A lot of homework. They have to they have to read and they have to take inspiration because this is how they can change themselves. Incredible. Uh, like, you know, I'm very happy because with so many uh, guys, uh, one of them, the barista Mark, he worked with us. He used to be barista. He's just making coffee. Now he's the head of fermentation. Because we don't serve alcohol in Orfali. So I felt like, you know, uh, we have also a small gaps, what we can do, juice pairing. So we are 
the first restaurant, one of the first restaurants in, in UAE who started making fermentation and juice bearing. Now we have a lab. A lab yeah. where you can just experiment and just do... Look, all the misos, pisos, soy sauce, shio, koji, uh, tabache, uh, kombuchas, ciders, it's happened in our lab. We you don't make worry. that. We make it that. Amazing. Yeah, mm-hmm. now we start making our own yogurt as well. And soon we have so many things that happen. You know, all the garum, the fish sauce, the mish- the, fat, the mushroom sauce, and all the things happen that's happened. That is the strength of our Fali Bros. Our food is strong. We have so many things, but we, we're making it easy. We don't want people like, to feel like, oh, this is... Awesome. And then uh, the juice pairing, it changed so many things, to be honest. Now we have about uh, nine drinks. Soon we are about 12 drinks. Some of them uh, come from the leftover of ingredients, like of the bread. The new one, left over from the sourdough, we we use it to to ferment something and we make a drink from that. Incredible. Delicious. About sustainability. 100%. And we stopped Amazing. all the soft drinks. And uh, soon uh, we're going to be only local water. And that's that's the, the, that's the how, we, how we moved. You know, we, we did something and we moved to other things. So Mark is one of the guys. He's like, no, he's, he's, he think more fermentation right now. Uh, Faye is one of the guys like you know he started with me as a young boy like you just want to work with me because he watched me on TV and then he, he followed me and it's like I just want to work with you he's now uh, handling the R&D team uh, the two brothers like the way we think about our dessert and uh, taking the ingredients you know we never buy uh, pistachio paste we get our pistachio we roast it toast it paste it we ferment you know that, it's so many things it looks like easy but believe me the, the the, I don't want to say the process, but the the heavy work that we have in in every uh, dish on every bite, it has so many things. But uh, again, you know, it's that respect. And vinegars for, also, we make our vinegars as well. Yeah, it's that respect for the ingredients and the value behind 100%. it, and you feel it. Yeah, you feel it when when you taste that food. What's next for you now? What's the next dream now? Uh, uh, I think <laughs> I want to make family. <laughs> this is not the next dream. It's the time now. Uh, I don't know if it's going to happen. You, you want a family? <laughs> of course I want to make family. This is it? Yeah. Kids? Yeah. It's time for kids. Yes. Let me find the girl first. And <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I think, I think now there's like, I want to make my father happy because, you know, he wants me to, to get married. Unless then. This is a l- ladies who are listening. Um, yeah. yeah, the door is open. <laughs> Are we hiring? <laughs> Professionally, what's, yeah. what's next? Uh, yeah. We're opening three bros. Yeah. Next to Orfali Bros. Three bros. Yeah. Which is going to be? Uh, another concept. I don't know. It's still like. Uh, tell, us, tell, us, tell us a little bit. What I just want. Okay, Orfali Bros. Uh, the kitchen is very small. Yeah. And we, we have a lot of recipe, but we can't do it right now because the space, the equipment, the kitchens, like not, the layout of the kitchens don't help us. So we decided to take the burger and the pide and the most of fun, comfort, del- delicious recipes to other concepts. Where the other concept, we have a bigger kitchen, we can do more and then give us the freedom uh, at Orfali Bros to do different. So we're going to do some re-innovation. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to increase my prices. I'm not going to do anything uh, different. We promise to be still the way we are and we're still the way we are. Since we get number one or we get uh, a Michelin star, we are we, who we are. We never change. We're going to stay the neighborhood concept who open the door for everyone. Yeah. So, but I think we can, we can, you know, we felt like, you know, now the time to, uh, to add more to the Orphali. Mohammed, what would you say, not just to young chefs, but to anybody who wants to do something, wants to achieve something, wants to be who they are, and how difficult that can be? Because I feel like that's the essence of your story, that you dared to be who you wanted to be when in, in the face of so many rejections. What is your advice? Oh, the taste of rejection is very sour. But the rejection, the amount of rejection that I get before I opened the restaurant and to believe in my concept and my idea, it was the fuel to, you know, to shape us the way we are. So you have to be very stubborn and you have to fight for your ideas. You have to, to do in it and believe in yourself. If you're not believing in your idea, who's going to believe in it? 
you know, I remember like, you know, before our family, was, was when I approached investors, like, you know, you look at me, mm, yeah, no, no, no. oh, not the time. Um, I did three, four concepts before our family and it couldn't happen. Until the time I decided to invest from my pocket. And this is, I think, the power. Once you put your money in and then the idea, people will understand, like, oh, this is serious. You're going to believe on this. But after a fairly process, you see how many investors do want to come and want to be uh, partners? I want to be like, you know, would love to work with you. Why? That's I, it. I think there are so many talented chefs in the city. There are so many talented uh, and creative people. I just, you need the guys to believe in them and give them, you know, the opportunity to do something. And uh, always, uh, the, the most important things, you have to keep this in your mind. And I learned that from my mentor. Your maximum is your minimum. So you can give. Once you put the limit, that's been done. I think that's a, an incredible point to to end on. We could talk for hours, Mohammed Orfali. What an incredible story. Elf Mabro, congratulations once again. And I know so many of us are just so incredibly inspired by what you do, by your food, by your story, all of it. So thank you so much for thank being you, with Sally. us. Thank, thank you. you for being on Powerplay. Shukran. <laughs>